Uh, good afternoon. It's the 1st of September 2019, and this is a session of the Black Man Who Reads Aloud Hour Project. Today I'm going to spend some time on the life of a great Negro, a publisher, editor of the New Age newspaper out of New York, Timothy Thomas Fortune. I'm going to be reading from the website, the American National Biography, as I look back to look ahead on the life of Timothy Thomas Fortune, born October 3rd, 1856, and who died on June 2nd, 1928. Timothy Thomas Fortune was a militant newspaper editor who, who was born in Mariana, Florida. He was the son of Emmanuel Fortune, a literate slave artisan, and Sarah Moore Jane, I mean Sarah Jane Moore, a slave. Timothy was raised amid the torturous times in Reconstruction, Florida. His father, one of the two African Americans elected as delegates to the 1868 States Constitutional Convention and a member of the Florida House of Representatives was targeted by the Ku Klux Klan and had to flee the area for months in 1869. 13-year-old Timothy became the man of the house in his father's absence. The constant fear, the stories of outrage, the sign of his high-spirited mother gradually breaking under the strain of anxiety all of these had a lasting influence on the sensitive and imaginative boy. Despite having less than three years of formal education, Timothy was an avid reader, enrolled at Howard University during the winter 1874 term. Inadequate finances forced Timothy to leave after one year, but not before he managed to complete a few law courses. His later writings would reflect an interest in constitutional law. Timothy briefly taught school in Florida and worked on worked for the Jacksonville Daily Union. Florida was then a degrading environment for an ambitious and proud African American. So Timothy migrated to New York City in 1881 with vivid memories of slavery and the exploitation of the post-war freedom Timothy never forgot them and spent his journalistic career supporting their political and economic rights. During the 1880s, frustrated by the Democratic Party's machinations and the inability of Republicans to protect their rights in the South, a number of African Americans called for political in independence and party affiliation. Timothy articulated their grievances in editorials, articles, and several books. He militantly cascaded both major parties for their mistreatment of freedom. In July of 1881, Fortune, George, George Parker, and Walter Sampson launched the New York Globe. A few months later, Timothy became the editor of the Globe, succeeding John F. Quarles. The Globe and its successor, the New York Freeman in the New York Age, would establish Timothy as the dean of black journalists. Under his leadership, they were rated by contemporaries as the most distinguished race papers in the nation. As the editor of the Globe, Timothy Fortune attacked the Republicans for not caring a snap of a finger for Negroes. He called upon blacks to form a new honest party. In 1884, his Black and White Land, Labor, and Politics of the South, a study of, of contract contradictory threads was published. In this study of race and race problems, Timothy was influenced by the writings of Henry George, the proponent of the single tax levy. Although Timothy Fortune criticized the United States for his brutal treatment of African Americans, he vigorously rejected Back to Africa proposals. Timothy Fortune urged blacks and whites to reject the established politics of independent voting and to understand that the future struggle in the South would be, would be between capital and labor, landlord and tenant. 
Timothy informed both that their common enemy was the capitalists and that the white workers who denied black unions affiliations were tools of the ruling class. In 1886, Timothy Fortune published The Negro in Politics, which accused the Republican Party of t contemptuous treatment of African Americans. Timothy demanded that the freemen place race before party and stop following those leaders who have swallowed up without a grimace every insult to their man manhood. Both white and black and the Negro in politics received wide coverage in the African-American press, but few blacks were persuaded to desert the Republican Party. Timothy Fortune's cry for political independence cost him control over the globe on the 8th of November, 1884, when Parker sold his interest in the purchaser, William Derrick, declared the globe would be a Republican Party. Paper. Timothy Fortune disagreed and the Republican Party refused to subsidize the paper until Fortune resigned. Fortune then established on the 23rd of November, 1884, the Freeman with himself as sole owner, editor, and chief printer. African Americans had considered the Democratic Party the party of bigotry, treason, and mob rule. Fortune's warm praise of Democratic uh, candidate Grover Cleveland raised speculation that he was seeking a political appointment. Timothy denied this assumption and countered that Cleveland would check reactionary forces within his party. Cleveland's appointment of Black's fortune wrote deserved credit <clears throat> and he was ready to support him if the Democratic Party pursues a broad, liberal, and honorable course towards us. This political unorthodoxy forced him, for a fin financial reason, to sell the Freeman on the 8th of October, 1887, to Jerome B. Peterson and Emanuel Fortune, Jr., his brother. A week before the new owners dissolved the paper and founded the age, in 1889, after Emanuel Fortune's death, he accepted the editorship of the age. In 1884, Fortune had conceived the idea of a national organization that would fight for the civil and political rights of African Americans. He suggested in a May 28, 1887 Freeman editorial that an all-black organization modeled on the Irish National League was needed. Organized in January of 1890, the Afro-American League had as its objectives the protection of black voters in the South, the end of the reign of lynch and mob rule, equal distribution of school funds to both races, the eradication of chain gangs and convict leases that exploited blacks, the end of segregated public transportation ve vehicles, and the end of discrimination by race in hotels, inns, and theaters. Timothy Fortune urged African Americans to agitate for their rights, which would make each one a new man in, the, in black, who bears no res res resemblance to a slave or a coward or an ignoramus. And that appeared in the Freeman on May 28, 1887. Although it had the support from the black press and conventions that were held in 1890 and 1891, the League, the Afro-American League, folded in 1893 because leading black politicians Frederick Douglass, John Mercer Langston, Branch K. Bruce, and P.B.S. Pinchback refused to support its pointed attacks against the Republican Party. The League's militant vision was later echoed in a modern civil rights movement. Timothy Fortune's militancy was tempered in 1895, when he engaged in an alliance with Booker T. Washington. Both men were Southerners who shared a common interest in self-reliance and manual education. After Booker T. Washington's famous 1895 Atlanta Compromise speech, you know, the speech where uh, Booker T. Washington spoke of casting your buckets where you are, Timothy sent the letter of praise Frederick Douglass had died earlier that year and 
Fortune informed Booker T. Washington, we must have a leader. For the next 12 years, the two were close friends, and Fortune served as a ghostwriter for Washington and editorially defended him from criticism of younger militants. Timothy's financial dependency on Booker T. Washington to publish The Age motivated W.E.B. Du Bois and William Monroe Trotter, who was the editor of the Boston Guardian, to criticize him for being a mouthpiece for Booker T. Washington. In 1901, when Booker T. Washington became an advisor to President Theodore Roosevelt on racial matters, for the next six years, Booker T. Washington and Timothy Fortune would engage in an in an enigmatic in relationship. At times, Fortune would vigorously defend Booker T. Washington from critics, but there were moments when he could not reconcile his own views on race matters and politics with the accommodationist views of Booker T. Washington. In 1902, his loyalty paid off when Booker T. Washington arranged for him to receive an appointment as a special agent of the Treasury Department to study race and trade conditions in the Philippines. The seven-month trip cost Timothy Fortune dearly in health and finances and made him even more dependent on Booker T. Washington's support. The alliance between Timothy Fortune and Booker T. Washington became strained when Timothy attacked Theodore Roosevelt for his indifference to the plight of the mistreated Southern blacks, and particularly for Roosevelt's decision in 1906 to dishonorably discharge three companies of black soldiers of the 25th Infantry stationed at Brownsville, Texas. On the night of August 13th, a group of unidentified men killed one person and wounded two others in the shootout. The soldiers were blamed, but it was impossible to identify the culprits. None confessed and not a single soldier offered to implicate his comrades. The black press, including the age, criticized the president for his unprecedented action. Since 1900, Timothy Fortune's drinking and depression had alarmed Booker T. Washington. Concerned with Fortune's erratic personal and political behavior, Booker T. Washington, who in early 1907 secretly became a major stockholder in the age, removed Fortune from the editor's position. Out of frustration, Timothy Fortune wrote to William Monroe Trotter, Don't let up on Roosevelt and Taft. Lay it on them thick, as usual. For the next three years, Fortune drank heavily and suffered bouts of depression that caused his friends to worry about his mental stability. During this period, his marriage to Carrie C. Smiley, whom he had wed in 1877 and with whom he had five children, ended in a separation that lasted until his death. Timothy Fortune's health was restored by 1910, and Washington, believing that he had been sufficiently humbled, organized the testimonial for him and returned him to the Age's editorship in 1911. Timothy Fortune left the Age in 1914 because debts kept him in dire financial straits. After Booker T. Washington's death the the next year in 1915, Timothy reflected that he had more in common with the militancy of Frederick Douglass than with Booker T. Washington and that he would have been better off if he had never developed an intimate relationship with the ed- educator Booker T. Washington. Timothy Fortune drifted in and out of writing assignments for the next nine years while he suffered from depression and alcoholism. In 1923, he accepted the editorship of Marcus Garvey's Negro World. Although he did not accept Garvey's immigration proposal, nor did he join the Universal Negro Improvement Association, he admired Marcus Garvey for his ability to mobilize the masses. For a time, he returned to his earlier militancy, urging his readers to eschew political dependency. Later, after Garvey organized a Negro political union and instructed his voters to vote for Calvin Coolidge, Fortune, mindful of his anti-Roosevelt editorials, had cost him favor, wrote no dissenting views about the Coolidge presidency. 
Timothy Fortune died in Philadelphia. The Negro World on June 9, 1928, eulogized Timothy as the one who, quite as much as Frederick Douglass, perhaps a little more than Booker T. Washington and a little less than Marcus Garvey, had been a helpful factor in the lives and fortune of the Negro race in, in this generation. Timothy Fortune was a visionary whose actions and writings in the 1880s predated the rhetoric of Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, and H. Rap Brown. Decades before the cries of black power and black is beautiful, Timothy Fortune called for race, love, and unity. Years before freedom rides and sit-ins and demonstrations, Timothy Fortune called for organization and agitation. This was written uh, by William Sorrell, and it, and it was published online uh, in, uh, in February of 2000. And if you go to anb.org, and look up Timothy Fortune, you will be able to read the article or this essay yourself. Today, as the black man who reads aloud looks back and looks ahead, I spend the day with Timothy Thomas Fortune. I will follow this with a reading of a speech Mr. Fortune gave. It's, it's a time to call a halt. 